This 48-minute video presents a live lecture Dr. Cutler was invited to provide for Summer Research College Fellows to augment their own understanding of how research and science actually gets done. Uh, what I want to do is tell you how, from a perspective of a psychologist who became a biologist, who started at her sinus, very excited, like I hope you are, to be able to do research and to discover what it meant to create some original project that nobody had ever done before and come out with a result that allowed to the extension of knowledge, a contribution to knowledge that other people could use to extend knowledge even further, what the excitement of that generated in me when I was at her sinus that launched me to do the things that I'm going to tell you the story of one of those threads through the journey of the discovery of human sex attractant pheromones. And it really begins with an understanding. If you look at Darwin and Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle, has anybody here ever read that book? One person, wonderful. That book startled me in reading it. This was a, a, a sort of sweet fellow who got on a boat and went to the Galapagos Islands and observed what was in front of him. And in observing what was in front of him, he generated the theory of evolution and what we think of as survival of the fittest. And it was much more simple and much more complex than that. I started with, really, with the moon. And we know about cosmic cycles, command human cycles. We know that we live through a day and a month and a year. And these are all cosmic cycles. And I was interested in how the interaction of the being and the cosmos and other beings promote health, wellness, longevity, joy, love, all of those things. And so I'm going to take you through pheromones as one of those aspects. Pheromones were defined by 1958. Now we'll see if I've learned this. There they are. As substances that had four characteristics. This is 1958 or 1959, but that means he figured it out in 58. And it was published in Nature in London, and said that there is a substance, and he called them pheromones, and he defined them as substances that have the chemical makeup of hormones. So I'll tell you what a hormone is. It's a substance secreted in a gland that gets into the bloodstream, that moves through the body, and affects other parts of the body. The testes gland makes testosterone. That affects the man's cognitive function, his libido, his lust, his drive, his energy, his force. A woman's ovaries make her estrogen and her progesterone. And women, unlike men, have this monthly cycle of estrogen, a monthly cycle of progesterone, a complex symphony of about 10 different hormones in flux with each other that I began studying was thrilled at the symphony of women. Well, a pheromone is not the same thing. It's a substance that has the chemical makeup of a hormone, but instead of being secreted in the body, is excreted through the underarms, anus, vaginal, the mouth, the ears, and it moves out into the environment where it elicits some behavior or developmental response in another being of the same species. And its purpose is to promote the reproductive survival of the species. That's what this is all about. We now know, in humans for sure, but starting with the dog, I can show you, the four behavioral actions of pheromones. If you've ever seen a dog urine mark, and that's a picture of it, urine marking is a laying down of pheromones from his urine to tell other males, this is my territory. If you come in here, I'm going to attack you because these are my females I'm going after. That's what it's about. Mother-infant bonds from breast milk that the female mother when she's in hospital and is wearing breast pads for all the moisture that's being secreted, when they take those pads and waft them over a bunch of bassinets in an infant uh, chamber, only the, the baby of that mother will turn its head to orient toward its mother's breast pad. All the other babies will ignore it. And that's mother-infant bonding. That's a kind of pheromones. Synchrony and fertility in essence, as you'll hear about soon and opposite sex attractants. These are the four. That's mine, opposite sex attractants. 
So let's start with the life history of menstrual cycles. And think about that word, menstrual. Do you see what's in the center of menstrual? Menses, moon. <laughs> menstrual cycles were always recognized from ancient antiquity as having some relationship to the moon. I'm going to take you, if I can figure out how to get to slide, well, I'll do this one first. This is an array of 25,000 menstrual cycle years of data. Think about 25,000 dots are in this one figure. And what these authors did, and they published it in 1967, was show the variation of human menstrual cycles throughout reproductive life. Again, we're talking menses, fertility, reproduction. And what they showed was during the peak fertility years, the x-axis is age or stage of life, the y-axis is length of the menstrual cycle. Uh, menstrual cycle, if a woman gets her period and starts bleeding January 1, it doesn't matter if she bleeds for five days or 10, if her next period comes January 30th, her cycle length is 29 days. That's the definition of a cycle length, that from day one to just before the next day one. What he showed was that the peak fertility years had an enormous tendency to have 29 and a half day cycle lengths with some variation around it. The darker the dots, the more dots, the more women's data there were. And he showed that the seven years before peak fertility, called puberty, and the seven years at the end of fertile life as women approach menopause and stop menstruating are very similar mirror images of each other in the pattern of the cycle length. We're going to find out why cycle length means so much to me, right here with lunar cycles and fertility. I was collecting, as I will show you very soon, uh, about ultimately 800 or 600 uh, different women who contributed menstrual cycle calendars where they kept daily records and of when they, when they bled for a semester. And they turned these calendars in usually by fax in those days. Do you still use a fax? Does anyone, do you even know what a fax is? Sort of. You know what a scan is? You can scan something and send it. Well, we used to take a piece of paper and put it in a fax machine and put a, t a telephone number to fax it to. And at the telephone's recipient telephone number, out came a copy of that piece of paper, like a photocopy. That was faxing. So we got all our data at, in those years by faxing. And what this is, is a graph of one of the discoveries I made along the way. I was collecting cycle data as a graduate student at Penn, and you'll see later why I was collecting it. But I had a woman professor in the biology department, and in that year, there were 49 faculty members, and no, 50, and one woman professor, and 48 men. And uh, that one woman said to me, you know, Winifred, you're collecting all these menstrual cycle data, wouldn't it be interesting to see if there's any relationship to the moon and the moon cycle? And I thought that's great because I love looking at data and seeing patterns because pattern recognition, for those of you who are mathematicians, you understand that in pattern recognition, you discover the truth of how things work. There's other ways to discover the truth, but pattern recognition is a terrific way. And what I did was I, I looked at the literature on the subject. And in those days, we went into the basement of the Penn Library and got deeper and deeper down, floor below floor. The older the, the document was, the lower in the crypt it was. And I did find that in 1895, a paper was published evaluating lunar menstrual phase locking, and they said they couldn't find it. And the person who published that won the Nobel Prize for other work. But I studied his work and said he did the question wrong, and that's why he didn't find it. And so what I did is do the question and say, what if we only looked at women who had a cycle the same length as the moon? And asked, if there's nothing going along, th those women will be arrayed all over the moon cycle the day they get their period, some in the full moon, some in the new moon, some in the first quarter, some in the third quarter. This is the array of 68 women in the autumn of 1977 who all had an average cycle length of 29 days. And each day along the, the, the graph is the proportion of that group of 68 women that got their period that day. And what it showed was, as the full moon was approaching the highest proportion, were getting their, starting their period. And as the new moon was approaching, the, lower, the lowest proportion 
That would be sort of interesting, but what got really interesting is it replicated in seven other years of data that were collected. And that was published, and uh, this was, for me, earth-shaking to say, the sun and the moon and the stars that thou hast ordained, what's man That's, that, that thou's mindful of him? Or the daughter of man, that the cycle is controlled by the moon. And I, I was pretty excited about that. You'll see sort of why in, so, soon. Now we shift to menstrual synchrony, another way the menses were studied. In 1971, Menstrual Synchrony and Suppression was published by Martha McClintock. She was a graduate student at Radcliffe, and she noticed in the ladies' locker room, the ladies' bathroom, that the trash cans filled with menstrual uh, uh, pads, used pads, and were overflowing certain times of the month, and other times of the month, the trash cans weren't overflowing. And just like a pattern-recognizing person, she said, I wonder if something's going on. She did a profound set of studies and showed that women who live together begin to menstruate together at the same time of the month. She didn't ask if that time was at the moon, but I met her at Penn when I entered graduate school and she was completing. I said, Martha, how'd you get your work done? And she told me about the trash cans in the ladies' locker room. She was just observing what was going on around her the way Darwin was observing what went on around him and what Heraclitus. Had anyone ever hear of Heraclitus? Oh, he said uh, in, the, I think, the 6th century BC that matter and energy cannot be created and cannot be destroyed. Uh, he figured that out. It just keeps changing, keeps changing. So Martha did that. Olfactory influences on the human menstrual cycle by 1980 was considered to be the cause of menstrual cycle synchrony, that something in the smell was causing women to synchronize together. Human axillary excretions influence women's menstrual cycles, the role of donor extract from females. We figured it out in 1986. I'll take you to those studies to show you. And by 1999, and look at from 1971 to 1999, Weller published a paper showing there was also menstrual synchrony in a sample of working women. Women who work together in close quarters start to menstruate at the same time of the month. They synchronize to each other. Now, what that will all have to do with a sex attractant is going to become clear soon, I hope. This was my first study. Uh, it was a pilot study as a psychology graduate student. I left her sinus, tried to get accepted into two graduate schools, but told the truth that I only was available 20 hours a week. And both Bryn Mawr and the other place said, that's very nice, it was nice to meet you, but we don't take graduate students who only have 20 hours a week to work. So uh, I didn't get into Bryn Mawr, but I did get into Penn a year later in a, using a different approach. And I started in the psychology graduate program, and they were there in that program very into rat sex. They were studying how uh, rat sex could be studied in a cage where you had uh, drop a female in a cage and the males always behaved in exactly the same way. Uh, I won't tell you what that way was, but they showed that the way they behaved determined the amount of eggs that were ovulated. And they were showing there's a relationship between how behavior influences the physiology of the fertile system. I was interested in studying that in humans. And it began with a menstrual cycle. And I asked women through a group of students like you. As a graduate student, I was able to find undergraduates who wanted to do a research study with a graduate student. And what happened was those students knocked on dorm doors, all women, knocked on women dorm doors and uh, tried to enroll other women who would be research subjects who would be willing to fill out a menstrual calendar every day for, three, for a semester to say when they bled. And we wanted to, and a lot of other information we wanted to gather. At the end of the 14 weeks, I asked the research assistant, like you are, to ask the student before she put her anonymous card into an envelope with a stamp on it addressed to me, where her research assistant would never see her personal information, write on that card what she thought in the last 14 weeks was her pattern of sexual behavior. Did she never miss a week of sexual intercourse? Did she never have sexual intercourse or somewhere in between? And when we plotted the data, at the, when we got all the data back, 20 of the women said they were weekly, 
20 said they were sporadic, and 20 said they were never. And of the 20 who said they were weekly, the cycle length, the average menstrual cycle length, you see the pattern there? That every one of them was within three days of a 29 and a half day cycle. Whereas the nevers and the sporadics could be in that range, being around a lunar cycle. We didn't know yet that the lunar length cycle is the most fertile cycle of women. And as women's cycles get shorter or longer, they become subfertile, less likely to be able to get pregnant, even if they get some sperm injected through their body and into the fallopian tube. They're less likely to conceive a pregnancy. All we knew then was the cycle length seemed to be related to the sexual behavior. After that, I switched from psychology to move into the biology department because my faculty in the psych department correctly said I didn't belong there. Uh, given the interest that I had, which is the physiology, the endocrine system, they thought I should shift to biology, and I was fortunate to shift to the biology department at Penn. And my faculty, the, the one woman professor that I told you about was my advisor, and she said, that's a really interesting pilot work. We really ought to replicate it and do it properly, have the data of the sexual behavior collected prospectively during the same semester as the cycles and a bunch of other information. Ultimately, we found the exact same pattern when it was prospective. The women who recorded that they had intercourse or they slept with a partner, the women who had regular sex with a partner uh, tended to have fertile type cycles. And it didn't matter if it was twice a week or once a week, once a week seemed to be sufficient. And now that's biblical. If you read Leviticus, Leviticus advises husbands to tend to their wife at least once a week, that it's a rule. And it, that's why I was asking about weekly because I had looked at the patterns in Leviticus. And these are, a lot of these science papers that I did came right out of there. They were forming the questions that allowed me to test the rules that were in Leviticus, or were they good for health, or were they good for fertility? And these were rules that turned out to be very good for fertility. They also advised uh, that a woman should not have sex when she's menstruating. And that's in Leviticus also. And I now understand that that was probably right too, because if a woman is orgasmic, it means her uterus is contracting. And if she's bleeding and she's menstruating, it means the lining of the uterus is coming down as blood flow. But she has two other tubes going, they're uh, fallopian tubes. And if you squeeze the blood during, because of a contracting uterus because of orgasm, I can imagine blood moving up into the fallopian tubes, out into the body, and the disease endometriosis. Has anybody ever heard of that disease, endometriosis? Several people have, and those are people older than most of you. I asked my professor who became my mentor, who was a reproductive endocrinologist and and a reproductive surgeon, Celso Garcia, and he said, wow, what an interesting idea, because they were treating endometriosis patients who were suffering from pain because the blood that had moved out of the uterus into the body was, uh, had hormones in it and that was embedding in tissue all over the body and multiplying and growing so that every time the hormones were causing the uterus to do things, they were causing parts of the body to contract and, and have a lot of pain, and it took surgery to remove that tissue. So he thought that was interesting, but it really came out of Leviticus, what behaviors made sense. Ultimately, we continued that study with another one and looked for fertility, not just by cycle length another year, but by basal body temperature graphs. A woman can put a temperature gra a thermometer under her tongue every morning before she gets out of bed and record her temperature. And there will be a pattern <laughs> of the temperature will swing up and down. When she ovulates, it will change. When she's finished ovulating, when she's in her luteal phase, it will change again. And a smart uh, woman who reads and knows how to do it can see when is her fertile moment and when is when is she not likely to conceive? And it was used as regulation for avoiding pregnancy. But that's a different issue than what we're talking about here. But what we found here was among 83 women in another year, in another study, 90% um, of the women who had weekly coitus had a fertile basal body temperature graph, whereas 54% of the women who had sporadic patterns of sexual behavior had a fertile basal body temperature graph, 
and even lower, the ones who were abstinent from sex, have even lower. So there's something in here about regular sex being associated with a fertile pattern. We don't know whether being fertile makes a woman have more sex or does having more sex make her be more fertile because associations are not causality. But the relationship was interesting to, to us. Now that leads me to summarize the 13 studies that have been done, all showing that interpersonal behavior affects um, other persons, which is suggestive of pheromones. You heard about menstrual synchrony, office worker synchrony, uh, infertility, the age of first coitus is the only one I haven't shown you yet, and I'm going to show you that. Well, I'll explain it to you. Uh, Dr. Garcia, who was the reproductive surgeon who was my mentor, and uh, he was a professor in the gynecology department, was an infertility expert, and he did surgery for infertile women. And he had a huge following because he was so competent. And I came up with this idea that uh, because I was learning in biology that baby birds have to hear their species-specific bird song while they're in the nest, the courtship song. Birds court each other. Their reproductive life is sexual, meaning a male and a female get together to produce progeny. And the male courts the female. And unless the baby, when it's in a nest, an infant bird hears the species-specific courtship song, when it grows up, it will never mate. And it seemed that there was a critical period for the development of fertile capacity in baby birds. So I asked Salso Garcia, do you suppose there might be a critical period for, to start sexual intercourse? That maybe your patients who are infertile waited too long. And he said, well, that's interesting. We gotta, you can study that you can, if you want to. And we found a whole bunch of undergraduate students who were willing to work with me one semester. And maybe once a week, we trooped into a conference room at the gynecology department, got a whole pile of patient records, and for every record looked at what was her diagnosis for infertility, or was she just a routine gynecology pa patient, and what was her age at first coitus. I'm going to show you what we found. This was the, the array of data. 800 patients data, the bar graph, each bar is one group of patients. The two bars on the right is the largest part of his practice uh, from about maybe five, the 500th patient to the 800th patient. And the width of the bar is the volume of patients that meet that category. And there are six categories of his, of his, of his diagnostic condition of his patients. The one on the far left are RG, routine gynecology patients. Their average first coital age was a little over six years, meaning from the day they got their first period, they were having intercourse within six years of that. So that would mean if she had got her first period when she was 12, which in then those years was probably normal, she had her first coital experience when, by, at 18. And the next one, pathology other than infertility, the average first coital age was 6.16, meaning 6.16 years of cycling of, of, of her puberty period. She had been in her puberty for 6.1 years. The SI is secondary infertility. These are women who could get pregnant, but there was a problem. They maybe had a baby once before, and now they couldn't. And they were also under seven years of menstruation at their first coital age, looking back. But the two primary infertility patients groups had a first coital age way later than the rest of the group that suggested to us, and this became another scientific paper, there may be a critical period in women for intimate behavior in order to develop the reproductive endocrine system in order to subsequently become fertile. That maybe humans are not that different than baby birds, that uh, we do have critical periods for the development of intimate conduct. So these were the whole array, and I stopped because I hadn't shown you infertility and age at first coitus. Regular sex was associated with regular cycles, meaning regular fertile cycles. That was replicated by someone else in 1991. Sleeping next to a male, a woman named Dr. Vaith showed that women who slept with a romantic partner were more likely to be ovulating. Regular sex produced an association with a fertile basal body temperature, you saw. Sporadic sex, that was the feast and famine pattern. Feast and famine in eating is very unhealthy. 
It turns out it's very unhealthy in sexual behavior too. A steady relationship is healthy. This feast and famine seems to disrupt the endocrine system of a woman. And what we found was sporadic sex was associated with a short post-ovulatory phase that would produce subfertility in those women. And regular sex doubled the estrogen levels in the fertile years, as well as in the perimenopausal transition to menopause. Regular sex produced less hot flashes. Menopausal women often suffer from hot flashes, but those who had regular sex tended not to suffer. Cohabiting with a man later onset of menopause. That was Lydie Sievert in 2001. Now why it would matter that to have a later onset of menopause, it means she's gonna live longer. Uh, longevity is related to how late you, you, your reproductive life ends. Underarm sweat. <laughs> Now we're gonna to get to this. Underarm sweat was starting to be thought of as a source for pheromones. I'm gonna show you that it was. But at the time, we had shown that it was, and Wedekind said, but isn't underarm sweat repulsive? And yes, it is. And they did experiments to show that it was less repulsive if it was not a relative of yours. Now that argues for a system designed to, to deter incest. And I think that's pretty neat. Um, but you're going to see that the element in the underarm sweat extract that does it has no bad odor. He didn't know that. So now we get to primate pheromones, the copulins. By the late 1960s, Richard Michael at Emory University was studying ovarian hormones and the sexual behavior of female rhesus monkeys, the closest thing he could come to to humans. And he was saying under laboratory conditions, Ovarian hormones, that's estrogen, progesterone, the ones I've been talking about, seem to relate to the sexual behavior of the female. Duh, interesting. Then he showed that primate sex pheromones existed, and they were of vaginal origin. Remember, a pheromone is excreted. And he showed, and if you look at the picture, can you see the, that baboon who's presenting her rear end? She, her job there, what she's doing is inviting the male to come uh, copulate with her. He called what was on her rear end copulence and because they promoted copulation. He also showed that uh, if he ovaryectomized and hysterectomized females, I thought these experiments were horrible, but I also liked what I learned from them for, for humans. If he ovaryectomized, if he did a hysterectomy, and an ovaryectomy, which about half of women in the United States were being prescribed at the time I was doing this research, um, those females no longer produced vaginal pheromones that could entice a male interest, even though they might uh, display their rear end and say, come and get it, boys. Boys wouldn't come. And unless he smeared the, the vaginal secretion of a hot female onto the rear end of a post-surgical female, then the females were attractive again. And so this was really the launching for me of thinking about sexual attraction. I used to argue with Richard Michael about some things, and, uh, but uh, that's part of the love of science where you can really argue with your colleague about what does it mean and why are you doing this and this is cruel, how can you do this, but I'm gonna use it. <laughs> so we go now to the work we did human axillary secretions influence menstrual cycles. You've heard how human behavior, whether it's women living together, women working together, women having regular exposure to a man, uh, influences their cycles. Well, we found human underarm sweat extracts did it. And what this experiment did, which was these two experiments were published in 1986. We, we got people who were willing, who were sexually active young adults who were willing to donate their sweat to, for this magnificent experiment we were going to do. And what they agreed to do was wear a gauze pad under their arm uh, attached to an undershirt or whatever clothing they were wearing to collect the drippings and at, for six to nine hours a day, three days a week for a 14-week semester. Again, college students like most of you we're very involved with all of these research studies. We could never have done any of them without them. And they went on to develop their own careers. So everybody won. But in this study, the extracts were collected. They were brought into the lab three times a week, put in a glass jar, labeled, frozen. 
until we had, we'd freeze them, extract them. Extracting means taking all these sweat extracts, putting them in a long tube, pouring alcohol over it, putting through charcoal, and the liquid that comes out has no odor. It, it doesn't have any of the stink. And that was the uh, pooled, that we then thawed it, pooled it in batches, froze it again, thawed it, and titrated that stuff into aliquots, little, vest, little, little quantities of fluid that smelled like uh, witch hazel. That was what it smelled like. The criteria to be an elite donor, and we wouldn't know that they were elite until all the collections were done, was that they were in a heterosexual relationship, they had agreed in advance they would not wear deodorants for 14 weeks. And I mean, these were noble people making this contribution for 14 weeks. They would uh, not shave their underarms, and they were 27 years old on average, if I remember correctly. They would not wear any perfumes in their underarm. They would wash in the morning and only with ivory soap. And for women, it was even harder to be an elite person. She had to not be using an oral contraceptive because the contraception is hormones, and hormones alter the cycle. And so we didn't know what that would do to pheromones. They had to have their menses at the full moon because I presumed intuitively that those will be the most fertile women because of the, the data that I've showed you already. They had to have basal body temperature data that they were collecting at the same time they were collecting the sweat extracts that showed that they had a fertile cycle because we were only going to use fertile cycles, uh, extracts. And the cycle, they had to have a cycle length of 29 and a half plus or minus three days. And when they were all done, we had all the donors, the sweat was collected and frozen, thawed for a year, batched and frozen for the wonderful, lucky recipients. I'm going to tell you about the recipients in a minute. The four donor women, their, their extracts were pooled by the day of their menstrual cycle. There was a day one batch, a day three batch, a day five batch, because we wanted to know, did the women's underarm essence produce synchrony? And you'll see that. The donor men were simpler. Uh, all the extracted essences were pooled together. But the women, they were batched from five of the uh, 12 cycles that were collected, and they were the ultra elite who met every criteria at the end when we could see who actually had the records that fit the criteria to be elite. The recipients now, a year later, in the autumn of 1983, came into the lab three times a week. And these people were going to keep records every day on a calendar. And I'm going to show you. That's a calendar that looks like this. And this is one week. This is another week. And within the week, there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the seven days. And there are about 10 behaviors to check off on each day. Did that happen to them that day? And those things are, uh, did I use aftershave? Did I? have petting, affection, and kissing? Did I have sexual intercourse? On and on. All these behaviors, you'll see them listed in a minute. Um, so the recipients were, were going to be pooled into one of two groups. If they had a menstrual cycle that was around 29 days, they were going to get female essence. If they had an aberrantly long or short cycle, they were going to get male essence. So there were two experiments that were going to go at the same time depending on the woman's cycle status at the start. And 19 women were in each of those two groups as recipients. And the results were this. And this, these results went internationally around the news as front page stories. It was essences, but not placebo, altered the cycle length to mimic the previously reported effect of persons on women's cycle. What I've been showing you about interpersonal behavior, this did it without any interpersonal behavior. Male essence three times a week was equivalent to intimate exposure one time a week. And what I mean by male essence, the person came into the lab and either had, depending on whether they were going to be testing placebo or the putative pheromone, the, the researcher swabbed this uh, alcohol that smelled like witch hazel above their lip, under their nose, three times a week, and said, thank you, go home, come on back in two days, come on back in two days, and keep keeping that record going, and keep faxing that in. Well, at the end of the study, the male essence to the women with aberrant cycles had caused the cycles to become normalized to the 29-day cycle. 
underarm sweat extract can make a woman normal in her cycle, it's fertile, fertile type cycle is pretty exciting. Female essence, I wasn't excited about as much because it caused synchrony. I, was re I really like the heterosexual dynamic. And those two studies were published back to back in 1986. And while those data were generating media attention, I was looking at the data of the women who got the female essence and their sexual behavior, which I told you they were recording. And I noticed something that we hadn't anticipated, which is in the first three weeks, the, the 11 women who were in the pheromone group, 36% of them were never missing a week of coitus. They were, they were weakly active. That's four out of the 11. The placebo group, one out of the nine. That's 11%. That was at the very beginning, the first three weeks of getting this smear on their nose, under their nose every, every other day. But the last 10 weeks of the same study, the same data, the same people, it had changed. Now 73% of the pheromone group we're having weekly sex, whereas still 11% of the placebo. The placebo didn't do anything, but the pheromone seemed to do something. And my intuition was what it did was make women more sexually attractive to men. I didn't know if that was true, but that was my intuition. And in good science, maybe good poetry, uh, maybe good humanities, there's always the interplay between the intuition and the actual data. And you, you need the intuition to collect the data. And then you need to look at the data. And with that, you bring back your intuition and say, what does this mean? And all of that um, led to a burst of news. Newsweek, Time Magazine, front page of the Washington Post. And we started at Athena Institute seeing whether we could develop a formula. It took us seven years of work in, at the Institute to develop a male formula and a female formula to, to be the formula that I thought would be the sex attractant component of the underarm sweat extract that we had collected before when I was at Penn. And it was not the same. It was a, I knew the 150 or so chemicals that were identified in each of those extracts. And I had to figure out what did I think would make a good potion. And, and that's what we did. And um, I gave some of that potion. Well, we, Revlon, you, Revlon just announced its bankruptcy last week. But have you all ever heard of Revlon as a, as a, comp as a cosmetic company? Revlon called me uh, when this news hit and wanted me and Tom, my husband, uh, to go up to New York and talk to them about possibly licensing our technology really almost before we had technology. And uh, Tom, my husband, is an attorney, and he was a big pharma attorney, and he said, they're never going to do anything if we don't go up with a fluid to look, show them. We have to make something. It can't, they, the, the minds of people need to see something. They don't want to hear it intellectually. They need to see it. And so we did. And we had little vials like this of this clear fluid, and the blue, the, the blue is the boys and the pink was the girls. And we brought them up and explained the science, and we discussed the possibility of their licensing with us. And a deal never happened, but we came back home. What they wanted and what my legal person there said was acceptable didn't match. But we were very glad that they were interested enough because they generated this. And I then gave a vial to my one of the women who were the directors of Athena Institute and said, would you like to try this? She said, sure, I'll try that, Winifred. What do I do? I said, well, what's your perfume? And then she said, I wear, and she named the brand she wore. And I said, okay, let's fill this bottle with your perfume and then dump one vial of the pheromone in it. And now you go home and once a day, shake the bottle, unscrew the lid, take a little bit of that spiked perfume and dab it here. You can dab it anywhere else you like, but make sure you dab it here. About three weeks later, she called me up. She was going nuts with what was happening. And she said everywhere she went, men were smiling, pursuing her, kind. They weren't rapists. They were genteel and gentlemen, but very interested in anything she had to say. They just wanted to talk with her and be with her. And I said, I think we got something here. And we then did a marketing study in Philadelphia. We made an announcement. We put a $100 ad in a... Uh, NABO, National Association of Women Business Owners, Philadelphia newsletter, saying, women, would you like to test a putative pheromone that might make you more sexually attractive, give you more power? 
and 10 women called up and said they would like to try it. One of those women was a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. And um, the Philadelphia Inquirer knew me as a serious scientist because I had been publishing and working for years on other things. And Tom said, OK, she can be in it. He is our legal officer. Nothing happens that he doesn't OK, because we were a little worried about that. But nine other women also did. And they would fax to me when they wanted to what their impressions of their reaction was. Philadelphia Inquirer watched her, their colleague, and they went nuts with what they saw because that young lady had a boyfriend who used to pick her up on his motorcycle and take her to McDonald's and suddenly he was bringing her flowers, he was courting her, he was inviting her out for romantic dinners, he was bringing her poetry. They said, we'd like to do a story on this. <laughs> do you have, can, would you let us talk to anybody else who we know you were testing? And I asked some of those other women and they said, sure. And they spoke to the Inquirer reporter. They broke the story in the Inquirer. And that led to an avalanche of uh, media. When the Philadelphia Inquirer then was a very big, important Knight Ritter newspaper. So we had television media in the day when there were only three channels, three, six, and 10. And all three channels, news entities, were calling and saying, could we test this? We see this. And we gave them vials. And they got the same result. And they would invite me on to talk about the result they were getting with the women who were using it and say, Susie, what happened to you? Montel, you wouldn't believe it, <laughs> it said, said Susie. You can see those videos on our website on the video section. We didn't doctor them. They're real. So that led us to start selling product before we had any double-blind placebo-controlled trials. And then we said, we have to do proper science, double-blind placebo-controlled. And I will show you what happened. Three different studies were done at the same time. I'm going to just read you this. Three double-blind placebo-controlled studies tested the effects of two synthesized human sex attractant pheromone formulas, male and female. These were published studies through peer-reviewed journals. Subjects recruited via published advertisements or classroom announcements attended an initial intake interview at which screening was completed, the study protocol and guidelines reviewed, and they were provided weekly behavioral calendars for faxing to the researchers in the three different places. Each subject provided his or her own preferred alcohol-based fragrance. Specific behaviors were described and reported daily. These are the behaviors. The behaviors were petting, affection, and kissing, and on. You can see what they are. At the end of the baseline period of two weeks, each subject came back to the researcher with their fragrance, and it was transferred into this bottle for them, and they chose an A or a B vial. One was blank and one was active. And the A or B was put on the top of their card. They chose a code name, and they went back with their spiked fragrance and continued the experiment. OK, let's get to the results. The results are shown here individually in Philadelphia men, San Francisco regularly menstruating women at this San Francisco State University, and Boston, the postmenopausal women. The co-authors of the Boston study were a Harvard researcher and a psychiatrist of some great fame who called me up and wanted to do something because she had all of these postmenopausal women who said they'd lost their sexual attractiveness. And she wanted to see, could I offer her pheromones to test on the women? I said, if you want to do a protocol with a researcher, yes, it'd be great. And that's when Joan Freebly at Harvard and Susan Rako at um, the psychiatrist near Boston got working together. San Francisco was a professor, Norma McCoy, with her postdoctoral fellow. And they published an equivalent study in the Philadelphia men was me and two colleagues at two universities that I had worked with for years. And what you see is in each behavior for each group, what percentage of the uh, users who tested pheromone had an increase over their own baseline. So if you take petting, affection, and kissing, 41% of the pheromone users had an increase in petting, affection, and kissing frequency per week. 
How many times a week? How many days per week were you kissing and, and hugging with a woman? Checking on this calendar that I showed you and you can see. And that data was extracted by students like yourselves. An enormous pile of data. All of that raw data is published so anybody else can come and play with it. And the San Francisco petting, infection, and kissing increased in 58% of the pheromone users versus 28% or 24% of the placebo users. And the Boston postmenopausal women, 41% versus 14% of the placebo users. So you go down each behavior, and there's a the significance level and the age groups. And here's the summary that for the reproductive aged men and women, those are the first two lines. 74% of the pheromone users versus a smaller percentage of the placebo users had an increase in at least one sociosexual behavior for the men and at least three for the women. The women's study lasted longer because we were, they were, not me, they were collecting six weeks of data, but they went for two cycles to omit the menses week. So they did the last three weeks of cycles after menstruation had stopped for each of two cycles. So the women had received the pheromone or the placebo for more weeks. We have since come to understand that the effect keeps increasing through time. And that's basically, we think, why the, the reproductive women had more behaviors than the men did. Who, and, and it just made sense to us because the men only, the study stopped after six weeks of use. Future pheromonal potentials are uh, available for people who want to study them. And you could maybe understand why I would say people who've had a hysterectomy, who've had breast cancer, who've had a prostatectomy, prostatectomy, and other surgeries that inhibit the romantic life of the person. Um, infertile couples that have no detectable pathology because regular sex promotes fertility. It's one of the things we saw. And, for, and pheromones appear to promote regular sex. Couples in marital therapy to get more loving with each other because that's what it does. And I will read you yesterday when an order, we take orders all the time, and a man ordered and he wanted another vial on the shopping cart, which is automated. And when that data was entered as the new order, I saw he had given a testimonial earlier. So this is a testimonial he gave in 2001 on his third order Yesterday, he gave his 28th order in 2022. I'd like to add that I had success with 10X, 10, Athena Pheromone 10X is the name of the men's. Even on my worst days, being in a not so positive mood, I've experienced more attention from women. Usually, no one wants to be around someone who might be negative or grouchy, but women have been more receptive when I'm actively and consistently using this stuff. Just an observation since I started using 10X two years ago. That was 2001, and 2022 was his, I think, 21st order that he just placed, because one vial does last about six months. So that is, in a nutshell, the course through science, the cosmos, and entrepreneurial focus. And thank you for your attention.